My name is Don Carter with Oxbow International Corporation. Very much appreciate you letting me come out and talk with you a little today. Um, it's uh, been great. Uh, Tom's had us out a few times, had a couple opportunities to talk with this group last year. And uh, uh, part of what I've been doing is introducing Oxbow. A lot of you from the berry harvester line are familiar with uh, the Corban product line, which Oxbow purchased in 2004. Um, and so I'm just trying to let everybody know who Oxbow is. Uh, we are made in the USA. Uh, all products are manufactured by uh, Oxbow. We have three manufacturing facilities, Byron, New York, Clear Lake, Wisconsin, and Linden, Washington. All the berry harvesters and grape harvesting equipment is manufactured in Linden. And approximately 35% of all equipment that we manufacture is shipped overseas. Uh, we've been in the berry harvester market since 1985. Uh, but who, who are we, you know, uh, other than the berry harvesters? Uh, we've been in a lot of battle since the 60s with Pixel and Byron equipment. We started out with the green bean harvesters that are harvesting for Norpac National Frozen Foods. Um, we also have uh, the 6220 grape harvester. Uh, that's just one of our product lines. We do a lot of harvesting down in California. Um, we've got the equipment up in the Columbia Basin as well. 6165 green pea harvester. We do have five pea harvesters running here in the valley. And Mag 630 sweet corn harvester. Um, with the vegetable equipment, we have over 200 harvesters running in the valley today. And then our 3525 dump cart, uh, typically used uh, seed corn and sweet corn. We do have some here doing some squash uh, sweet corn on the pot. Berry harvesters, what's new? We've changed the look of our harvesters. Everything used to be badged as a quarter band and was painted the typical quarter band blue. Oxbow products have been painted gold since uh, 2001, and we wanted to bring the berry product along line along so that there was a similar look through all our brands. So the quarter band name is gone, and all berry harvesters are painted gold starting in 2013. Model 8000 uh, berry harvester. This is typically, uh, it is referred to as the one drop machine or uh, we also call it our fresh market machine. And this is our kind of a, uh, an entry level berry harvester uh, for blueberries. Uh, it's, it's not used at all cane berries. And it's a simple design. It's a single drop uh, from the, when you harvest it goes down onto the cup conveyor. From the cup conveyor, it carries it to the rear of the machine where it raises up. There is a fan system there to blow out the majority of the leaves. And then there's loaders on either side of the machine and it's going right from that initial cup conveyor into the lug or flat. We improved the front entry going into it, added some more radius to the edges coming in so that we do a better job of lifting the canes so we're knocking less fruit off. All new electrical system, it is now a can bus electrical system. It greatly reduces the number of wires and relays on the machine. We are utilizing plus one display for uh, controls and being able to monitor the engine and all functions of the harvester. We also have the total control joystick. This gives you all the operations of the machine right at your fingertips as far as leveling, turning on the fans, conveyors, everything is right there for the operator. And this is the back of the single drop design. You can see this is our loading station on either side of the harvester and then the fan discharge. This machine is commonly uh, used with trailers in the field. Uh, there is some room for uh, storage on the machine. You can get about about a pallet and a half, maybe two pallets if you're really good at stacking on it. But most commonly, 
they will put trailers behind it, uh, six trailers in the field. You go through, as you fill the load, you turn around and put them on the trailer. When you get to the end of the field, before the machine pulls out, they'll unhook the trailers. Machine pulls around, pulls, goes into the next row. They hook onto empty trailers. Machine continues going and harvesting. And then someone stays at each end of the field to unload the trailer and get it ready for the next time the machine comes around. Our 7420, this is our top loader. Uh, Multifunction as far as being able to do blueberries or cane berries. This was our standard front end up until 2012. Uh, we did some testing with a new front end. This one you can see that we're starting to uh, lift and compress the plant before the catcher system. <coughs> this is our new extended nose. It's 29 inches longer, and the catchers actually proceed where we're starting to compress the plant, and it makes a substantial difference in the amount of fruit that we're catching in the field. <coughs> Apologize for a couple of these pictures. I just took them yesterday here to show. But uh, also new for this year, uh, in the past we always had lift up gates. There were center posts in here. Uh, so you lift the gates out of the way, and then you can remove your pallets. And uh, they can get tricky to get pull out you know, uh, above your head. And also, uh, you'd have the post in the way, and every once in a while, a forklift would hit one of the posts, and so you'd have to pull it back into shape. So we've added swinging doors for 2014. They swing 270 degrees, so when you open them up, they will fold against the side of the machine, so you don't have to worry about the forklift running into them. And once they're opened up, the back end is completely open, so you don't have to worry about the post. And we store three pallets of fruit on the back end of the machine. There are also uh, side doors that are also swinging gates, and we can put uh, two pallets on the sides, and you can grab them from either side. Those gates swing forward so that they don't interfere with the rear doors. And we do have the option of putting a roller system in on the middle of the machine so that we can add a sixth pallet or six pallets of storage. We also widen down our deck. Uh, again, just trying to give people more room. Uh, when, you, when you go into the field and you get your pallets loaded up and you're unloading all the flats, you do need a lot of storage space. So there's a couple of areas that we're finding kind of cumbersome to be able to move the flats around. One of those was this area through here. There was more than enough room for the flats but it just was made a little bit awkward for pulling them in and out. So we've added six inches of width to be able to make it easier to move flats back and forth. Then in front, our side extensions uh, used to stop 30 inches before we would get to the front of the machine and limited our storage area for flats. And when we're trying to do five or six pallets, you need all the you can get. So, we did add these front corners uh, on both sides of the machine. And combined with the extra width, uh, we added 16 feet of, of space on the machine. LED lighting, uh, 2014, everything has gone to LED lighting. Uh, it gives us the ability to be able to add additional lighting. Um, we're, we're putting the same amount on there, but it's been very common that customers want to add additional lighting for their own preference. Uh, LED lighting pulls less amperage, so being able to add additional lights without overloading the circuits is a very good thing. Okay. Uh, this is the control panel where the operator sits. All your adjustments are right at those fingertips for all, uh, all conveyors, all panels. We do have an emergency stop button both for the <laughs> operator, also in the back at both inspection tables. There's one for immediate stop. We also have added uh, bucket reversing. So if at any point you get a jam in the bucket system, you can flip the switch and reverse it to clear that jam and continue on without having to open up any of the guards. Then our 9120 raspberry harvester, or caneberry harvester. Uh, this is our side row machine. Uh, the least expensive option for uh, doing caneberries. Uh, have approximately two flats 
or to, to pallets of storage available to it. Um, a push-pull cleaning system. We're using pressure that's coming up, pushing through the belt that kind of floats the fruit and then allows any leak material to come out and then a suction fan above to assist and pull all that material out. Uh, it does have 14 mile an hour capability on the road. Uh, 23 inches of, of lift for uh, being able to accommodate any side hills. And minimal fruit drops. And uh, the the belts do adjust up and down with the machine, so it does make it a little bit easier to, uh, for the inspectors to be able to walk that through. We do sell direct here in the Lima Valley. Uh, myself and Brad Bonney, who is at the back of the room here, uh, we do handle the sales. Our parts and service are handled through GK Machine. Uh, they do stock a full complement of our parts. And during harvest season, Oxpo does have Oxpo personnel here during the harvest season to take care of any service calls or uh, problems that anyone may have. So, any questions? Why don't you turn off the... Why don't you sit up here now? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes, sir. You know, do any of these harvesters have uh, GPS auto steer capability? Yeah, the, I think both of them have auto steer capability. Uh, the Latau does not have a GPS option, but it is uh, sensors on the sides of the base of the row, uh, dual sensors that uh, kind of coordinate between uh, two, sets, two sections of the plant, so it averages between. And we have the same, we have a mechanical option for the row finding to stay on center of the track. But we do have machines with uh, GPS steering on them as well. That is an, op an option. Yes, sir. Do, <coughs> do either of your companies get involved at all in kind of nutritional programs that would harden the fruit to make it more successfully uh, picked? As, as far as our actual involvement in that, no. Uh, we work with the universities and such, and we're, we're always staying in contact with them. We're always looking how can we improve, you know, particularly for fresh market, that quality. And so we're always looking for what opportunities there are out, out there. But we're, we're equipment people. We, we don't get involved with how the plants are farmed or the genetics or anything like that. We, we, we stay in touch with that and try to stay active with what is going on within the industry from the standpoint of how we can help that from a mechanical standpoint. And I would agree we're in the same situation where we generally would make recommendations, uh, you know, such as uh, plant support to keep the fruit quality and the firmness of the plant. Uh, harvestability with machines is greatly dependent upon the health of the plant itself. Uh, as you see, both of us, many of our customers are getting heavily into organics. Uh, therefore, the, the mulches and, and natural uh, chemistry on it, you know, putting, uh, you know, plant, plant uh, bugs in there, the good bugs, <laughs> you might say, to, to help with things. Uh, so, as, as a company, generally, you know, uh, we make recommendations to certain, uh, let's say, uh, nutritionists for the plants that are that are working well in the area and and that that's uh, about as close to it as we get so, yeah. I, well, I guess one example um, I understand that there's some universities or groups in the East Coast that are working on a blueberry tree instead of a bush and you know if you can get to the point where you're only sealing around a trunk a single trunk instead of multiple trunks that's going to help you in both recovery as well as fruit quality because you know it isn't just berries hitting on the harvester but when they're hitting limbs on the way down in the bush itself you know all those things hurt so if, if the genetics come along that they can do things like that we're going to change the machines in order to follow the direction that the genetics take it 
Just, just a quick question. You guys in the back, can you hear okay, or should we use the microphones? Can you hear okay? Okay. Uh, we were, uh, we were both right just back at that show there, and uh, it, it sounded like they were making it sound like some of this tree grafting was like going to be available, like you know, here, here right away. <laughs> you know, uh, is uh, from our end of it. You know, a lot of the genetics in the in the plants to be machine harvestable need to be clone cuttings off so that you have a whole field that reacts as a single plant. And in, in the genetics of the rootstock, uh, which they're trying to go to a wild rootstock at basically at this point, it looks like we could be a few to several years off from developing that to a, you know, a controlled genetic rootstock that was all equal to don't throw our pick sequence off of our plants. Because I'm sure Don, as much as me, hates a blooming plant next to a ripe plant with a green plant on the other end of it. That, that makes our lives miserable when you're trying to machine harvest. Keep, keep your genetics in mind. Pick your, pick your suppliers carefully. Watch what other people do. I got a question for you guys. It's that it seems like the blueberry harvesters are really diverging from the caneberry harvesters. I mean, as far as they're going for fresh pick, fewer crops, everything else. Are you seeing problems with guys who have something for blueberries that they can't use for caneberries, or vice versa? Well, on, my, on my note of that, the only bad thing about the, the new blueberry harvesters going into caneberries is. We're, we're putting extra expenses into trying to reduce our drops, increase our yield, all these things. It does probably burden the caneberry harvesters with a more expensive machine than what they would like to see. But as far as the machine's capabilities, our bigger heads and both our machines uh, clean up the, the caneberries, uh, especially you know, like when we're talking marrings and such, when you get that heat and it seizes that berry on, it's nice to have enough energy to turn it up and get that out of the plant before it, uh, you know, starts to mold and create other problems for your next fix. So, so the, the machines are, are really awesome in the game berries, both the machines now that we have bigger shaking capabilities, bigger conveyors, you're stacking fruit less, your fruit quality goes up, your, your grades hold better. Typically in cane berries, it's always an IQF, but it, it'll hold an IQF, uh, a pick or two longer than before, which is severely better priced than just uh I, I basically agree with everything he says. Um, you know, the, the the fresh market side is certainly driving the blueberry side of things, and so we're doing everything we can to reduce any any damage, any bruising that we possibly can. And you know, that does give some benefit on the caneberry side from the standpoint of. You know, if, if we got less drops on a blueberry harvester and you're using that for your cane berries, then maybe you can harvest a little bit later in the day, you know, as far as the temperatures and such, get a little bit more harvest time in. But it, it also does drive costs because, you know, to, to uh, develop these uh, things in order to reduce damage, it does frequently cost more. One more thing I'd like to throw in, too. Uh, a lot of attention is being paid to the temperature uh, you know, the sequence of temperature when the temperature drops off. Sometimes in the evening, sometimes it's, uh, you know, early morning hours, but, but also with the fruit quality, we're seeing more nighttime picking with us, like LED lights and stuff that they're putting on, uh, that, you know, it's a benefit to, to light up the world that you're out there in. Uh, because uh, the, the typical pick is now at nighttime. If you guys got any questions, oh, go ahead, Gil. I yeah, have a comment followed by a question. Um, I've driven lift house machines at the research facility at North Atlanta for quite a number of years. One thing I've noticed is that it's, you, you want to get down as low as you can, but a lot of our organic research, especially, has got meat mat in it. So if you're getting too low, start ripping the weed mat, and in blueberries, you are either scraping the weed mat or moving sawdust. And I'm wondering if you have a, a camera that you can locate 
down below the screen for the driver so that you can more easily adjust the height of the machine. There's, there's different things that can be done. Um, first and foremost, as, as, a, as a manufacturer, I guess you know, I would recommend that you take a look at the machines that you're going to be harvesting with when you're doing the planting. Because a lot, a lot of difference can be made at that point. It's, if you can build your mound right for the machines, it's when you get that extra wide mound and you're trying to, trying to straddle that that you run into some of those the worst problems with it. But a lot of cases you're talking about existing fields. And uh, I don't know, I, I've never seen a camera mounted down there. Certainly it could be done. Um, you know, they're, they're small enough, they could be put anywhere. How effective it would be, I don't know. Uh, there has been testing done with feelers where you actually put a, uh, a feeler down there that can set a sense if you're down that low and then if it trips it, it'll raise the machine back up again. Uh, I don't know that it necessarily really improves things though because people then tend to rely on it and things like that are not 100% foolproof. You know, if, if there's just a little dip in your weed map somewhere, <coughs> that allows the machine to go down at that point, then you may end up tearing up more if you're not paying attention, expecting the sensors to, to do the job for you. So I, I don't want to give you the answer you want, but you know, there has been some things tried. There are some cameras out there, especially if you go to like your car audio uh, places, you know, they're putting reverse cameras in cars now, you know, for pretty cheap money. So there are some pretty decent colored uh, cameras out there. Our, our biggest uh, problem on these harvesters is we don't have caps. So the money to get a color display is, is astronomical. It's IP67 that's going to hold up. If you, you know, bought the car camera, put it in a box and didn't wash it, probably in it for 600 bucks. You get one of these IP67 rated displays, you're probably 2,500 bucks. But by the time you get the camera and that, that will handle the wash downs and stuff that we, we deal with. Uh, some of the things that we've done over the last couple of years, and you'll see when we went away from the double staggered catchers, the two and a half inch base catchers, and went back to the single row, three and a half. We also narrowed up our catcher belts. We moved our, our catchers out, longer plastic, uh, to accommodate, you know, we're 33 inches between the, the bars. We went to a bent profile bar instead of a square tube bar with the, you know, flat, uh, you know, gusseted pieces underneath. Sand the heck out of it so there's nothing sharp that can snag a mat. So when you do touch it, it, it don't tend to drag it. If you push it hard enough, it'll bunch up. But usually you can feel that a little bit. Uh, so that, that's been helpful. But, uh, you know, of course the long catchers also have drawbacks, right? When you fruit load them real heavy, they, they push down and we continue to work with the you know, strength of catchers like the forming of all edges down and, and uh, you know, even, even thicker materials. Of course, thicker the material, the more, you know, return impact spring pressure it takes and the more plant damage it does and the more disease is caused by that. So it, it's definitely probably one of the biggest zones that we look at as machines is the catchers, bumper bars, width of the tunnels. Uh, so, so we're definitely, you know, if, you, if you're willing to work with us, we can definitely try something, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, production ready, you know, it would probably take us a couple applications. Uh, we, we both probably run our displays in our dashes now, you know, for all of our stuff. Uh, for you know, probably another grand to get the bigger color monitor, you can then run digital through it and switch off your functions and, and watch on the same display. So there are options, but you know, the, ultimately the cost of the machine kind of keeps us from jumping into those. If you do want to go that direction, I strongly recommend number one. There, there are black and white cameras on the market. You stay away from those. They don't give you enough differentiation. You won't be able to tell the difference between the soil and the weed mat. And even the uh, color ones, there's very big differences in the quality of them. And the lower end ones, you again, will struggle to differentiate between the, the contrast. There's another question back yeah, What's the minimum vertical clearance for the over-the-row harvesters? Zero. Uh, 
Uh, we, we, both harvesters will physically sit at ground level. I guess I'm asking, what's the distance between the bottom of the wheels and the bottom of the deck? Oh, on ours it's 89 inches uh, tunnel width, and then to the to the top of the deck is uh, uh, do math here, uh, like 97 inches. And I, I apologize, I actually don't know those numbers, but we're, we're, we're very similar. You know, I'll bring up one of my, my issues. Uh, one, one sorry, go ahead. Um, but then also keep in mind that you've got the leveling. So, you know, you, you can raise up and, and change those dimensions, but one is laying flat on the ground, you would be correct. Okay, we, Julie tells me we just got a couple minutes left, so there's a burning question I was about to ask. Um, yep. Yeah. Talk to the immediate level of the expected though. Or blueberry going <coughs> down and the machine going down a steep hill or up a steep hill, you vary the cup speed, you put it, you got those only little flaps on the back, but is there anything could be done similar to uh, auto level combine or something. There, there is, and we've been uh, working towards that. Uh, is one of the things that we just did, kind of taking some of that uh, thought process, was like on the SS8 spreader, you see how the conveyors just pinned in two locations, and then we, we just got a bar to move it. So it's been some discussion of just having a manual system on it, but we could also put a, a level system on it too. Uh, manual would be good enough. Yeah. And, and uh, with our bridge design on that uh, conveyor, uh, there's some talk on the 2014s to lower the bridge away from it to give it, you know, a couple of inches in either direction to, to do that. And uh, so some things we're definitely looking at for the 2014 production run on those. And we do actually have a front rear level capability on our machine. So we can level it on the machine or the on the, the entire machine. We, we have yeah. side side and four out. You still got to keep the machine filled with the contents of the ground. Correct. What's the cost of the 2014? Uh, 190. Same. Depending on options. There's there's a lot of options. Just <coughs> my question. Um, you know, it always bothers me on the pricing of these guys because it really is getting more and more expensive and more and more complicated. So, and I'd really like to see some simpler designs for guys to be able to get into the market and for dealing with smaller acreages. Because you guys basically almost set the economics of how many acres guys need to be able to use what you need to produce these things. What would you say is the minimum acreage? Well, could you just comment on the pricing? the complication, the directions, the trends that go on? Uh, on the pricing, both of us probably are experiencing over the last two years the least amount of uh, increase in price for us as manufacturers and the highest increase in price as uh, purchase parts uh, for in particular the tier three uh, application for the engines. Our engines nearly tripled in price from what we were paying to what we are paying now. So for the last two years, 100% of the price increases that you're seeing were absorbed by the engine manufacturers, the charge air coolers, uh, equipment that we had to buy, all the intercooler tubes. I mean, these, these machines are a work of art of air plumbing inside of them at this point. And, and you know, every one of those cool little bang clamps with the spring tension on them, you know, six, eight bucks, Two per little, you know, twelve, fifteen, eighteen dollar coupler. That you got six of them on each air, air, air inlet, you know, to isolate the vibration away from the engine to the, you know, the, the new thousand dollar radiators that they're holding to, to try to cool the air back down. And uh, you know, the only thing we got to look forward to now is tier four, which if we'd have went to it this year would have been over two million dollars worth of extra expense. But it wasn't even actually available uh, to any of us. It, you know, it's on the books, but you can't get a, a you know, a tier four application coming 3.3 this year. It wasn't. We couldn't order one. I don't know. You guys probably can't get your hands on one either. Okay. I. I what. What are tier three, tier four? What's it's, it's emissions. emissions. Oh. 
So pretty soon we'll be able to take these uh, machines, we'll take them down to California, and we'll just let them sit there and run all day to clean the air, because the air coming out the tailpipe will be cleaner than what goes in. And so <laughs> unfortunately, that, that's about what we're faced with. So, so there, there's, there's Tier 2, which we've all been running. Uh, we just both switched to Tier 3 uh, in drone. You know, we're, we're actually under application to run Tier 3 because we're supposed to be in the Tier 4 in drone. And then Tier 4 finals coming up in like two years. But, but they're having troubles making the engines do what they're wanting to do. So the engine manufacturers are actually going to discontinue some of the engines. Both the Kubota, the 2203s won't, won't move into Tier 4 final. The, the Cummins 3.3s are going to probably, you know, go back to a 3.0 or a 3.4, you know, to, to make all their final, because they've got to throw so much money at it. They, let's say you had five engines, you're going to say, okay, I'm only going to take this one and this one and move these forward and spend the money on them and not have so many engines, just because of the extreme cost from the, from the manufacturing side. Yeah, so what Don commented. Uh, he, he, I don't know right. Uh, engine emissions. Um, our, our company, with all our product lines, we have over 40 engineers uh, working for us, and for the last three years, about 60% of their time has been tied up with trying to meet emission standards with all the changing standards. We're having constantly change engines. When you change engines, you know the, the old engines had no electronic components to them. Now all the electronics is having to be tied into the engine. That means you got to change the way that you wire the machine. You're having to put in a larger radiator because the engines run hotter, so you got to have more cooling capacity. You got to have the charge air. Um, you know, and it, and you talked about the cost and, and an example of that. And he's exactly right. We're, they're telling us we need to be tier four, but today engine suppliers can't give us a tier four engine. But in the larger horsepower that can, in 400 horsepower machines for our pea harvester, where a tier three engine cost us in the low 30s. A tier four engine of similar horsepower is going to be close to fifty thousand dollars. It's almost twenty thousand dollar increase just to meet tier compliance, and that's our cost. So, so that's that's a large part of what's driving the cost. Things are not going to be getting cheaper. What's the maintenance cycle on these new engines going to be like? I mean, how complex is that maintenance cycle for an operator or an owner going to be? It's just the oil and air filter. I mean, uh, so until, it's we get it, until we get into the DDF and, and uh, you know, filtered exhaust systems, at that point, then it'll be an hour-based increment. We're not sure yet because the engines aren't even available to us. They can't give us the specs today. So you're not going to have, like, a, a, a liquid injection as part of the system like they're doing on some of the DDF? It it's possible that if you go through the different manufacturers, some of them are going one direction is yeah. in order to meet those requirements. And some Others are going other directions. And some of them are having to combine all of them in order to meet those. Okay. And, and we're, we're, we're very cognizant of that. And we know that people don't want to be put in in depth. We know that they don't want to have a, 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 a particular filter that's got to burn itself out because you know we're in fields and you know, fire hazards and such. So we're, we're looking for those manufacturers that are giving us the options where we don't have to go those directions. So that we can give you that reliable equipment. And then we'll, as, as uh, OEMs, we'll be purchasing real expensive uh, filtration cleaning operations so that we can meet your cycles as, as they come to be. But whether those are 1,000 hour cycles, 2,000 hour cycles, we don't know yet because it's not available to us. But, and eventually we'll be purchasing and having to have on hand uh, you know, exhaust filtration equipment to, to test, monitor, and so, so the best thing I can say for inexpensive machinery is, is both of us probably have you know a thousand to fifteen hundred pieces of simpler inexpensive machinery that already is in existence. We'll continue to do the maintenance on that and continue to cycle that back into the field to help people grow. But they better get one soon. Cause, cause probably we have a, we have a list. Back. We have a list right now of you know sought after machines that, uh, you know, as we get trade-ins, you know, the first guy on the list gets, a, you know, an 08 or a 92 or a 87 side or whatever it is, you know, you're always trying to pick up that old equipment and bring it in, refurbish it, make it reliable. Another factor in this engine game 
trying to bring to life to all of our customers is that effective this year, we cannot just go and replace your engine. You can rebuild that engine, but you got to take it down, go find all the pieces, the machine we're going to put it back together. Probably not going to have that ready to go tomorrow afternoon the way you like it to be. So plan your maintenance stuff. Right now with Kubota, we have uh, once a month, at the beginning of the month, we can order engines. They have a three-month build time, one month on water, unless you want to air freight it, I'm sure you don't, to, to get that thing back to us. And then we have to serial number it as a repower. We, so if we got 12 engines on order right now for production side rows, and we got 12 engines for, for repower, if we go 24 on production, we can't touch these. We have to buy them, we have to have them four months ahead of time, sitting there so that we can apply a serial number, engine number replacement. If your engine has to come to us, you can't keep it, we must destroy it, send a proof of destruction back to manufacturing, keep EPA satisfied. If we fail to do that, you have a mere daily fine. Uh, you guys get off pretty cheap at $3,470 or something like that per day about mm -hmm. operating that engine while it's in your machine, even if they don't catch it until 2050. And uh, we get a $34,000 per day fine for doing it. So it's kind of like a don't do it plan by the government. <laughs> <laughs> we we got to cut it off. And move okay. Off. But I mean, it's all really good. Give, give these guys a hand.